my pleasure to introduce uh, Jean Dubrow. Uh, I don't, I think I, we were fortunate to have Jean visit our campus in Leonardtown a year ago last fall. And um, that was such an enjoyable event. Uh, she came in and, and spoke, uh, read from her uh, previous collection called Stateside. And uh, it was uh, a very uh, moving experience for uh, many of the people who attended, not only the seminar in the afternoon, but the reading later that evening. So it's, it's again my pleasure to welcome Jean here to, to CSM. So happy to have you. Um, yesterday in class, in my English Lit class, uh, I brought up, among other things, um, uh, if my students could talk to me about the Cold War, uh, the Iron Curtain, Chernobyl, uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall. And they said they'd heard of that, those things, and, but they didn't, weren't really familiar with them. And that made me think about something that I've, over, I, that I've dealt with in, my, in a French culture course I teach here, which is Americans don't care for history. They just don't, it doesn't, it doesn't affect them. It's not something that they pay much attention to. And maybe in schools too, I don't know. But, um, but then I asked, why, why, don't, why aren't we? Uh, why don't we know more about history? And even about the, the recent past, like Jean's book is, is about, you know, behind the Iron Curtain, growing up. Um, Fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, Chernobyl. And one of my students shouted out, in high school, we studied the Greeks. <laughs> so <laughs> I said, well, that's good. And thank you for that. Um, uh, so we're not talking Greek history tonight. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to talk about recent um, world history. We don't care about history because we don't feel connected to it, I guess, is one answer to that question. Maybe it's because it's in the past. And we're always in this culture looking forward, looking ahead to the next best thing. It's always forward, forward. And it seems like that's how we're wired, you know, as a country. I thought, um, you know, something in the water kind of thing. We just, the history just doesn't, doesn't appeal to us. So, so we as a class, we read some of Jean's poem, poems in class and very soon realized how far from being apart from history that is separate from history, we embody the history we live. And her poems show us this. It's as much a part, history is as much a part of us as the clothes that we wear, our bodies, our emotions. Um, and one poem we read at the end of her poem called November 1989, um, we see how a young girl coming of age is like the world changing at the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall. And when she says the girl and the world back then barely recognized themselves in the mirror, it sounded like one of those lines when I read it and when we read it in class, one of those lines, those truths that you know deep down, that they barely recognize themselves in the mirror, the world and this, and, this, and this girl coming of age. A truth that you know but never had the bless you, never had the words to articulate. And for the girl in the poem and for the world, you know, the possibilities of tomorrow are endless, particularly at that time in history. So by linking personal history to world history, Jean shows us that history matters because, because it is personal. And from the deprivation and oppression of her time in Eastern Europe growing up as a young girl, to the greed and the excesses of her life here in the US, she makes us ask questions. Questions like, so what are you gonna do about it? How are you gonna live? What responsibility do you have to deal with the problems of today? How will you leave the world a better place than you found it? Maybe Americans don't care much about history, but deep down, I think we do. Sometimes we just don't know it. And so I want to thank Jean for reminding us, OK? Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Jean Dubrow. Yeah. Thank you so much for thank you so much for having me back. I'm I'm so grateful um, to 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 both Neil and, and Dwayne for for doing that for me and uh, for Wayne for doing that for me. Um, I had a really moving time the last time I, I read with here, although it wasn't here, it was the other campus. Um, it was I was reading from my book Stateside, which is about my experiences as a military wife. And it was a room full of um, not just students from the college, but also veterans and military families. And it was extremely rewarding to feel like sometimes poems can matter to people. So tonight I'm going to read from, um, from Red Army Red, 
uh, which is my fourth book. And um, it's about my experiences in some ways uh, growing up in the Eastern Bloc, uh, particularly looking at that moment when I, when I came of age. Uh, I, I turned 14, I hit puberty um, the year the, the Berlin Wall came down. And in my imagination, those two things, my coming of age and this transformation of, of history, uh, almost seemed to merge and become one thing. Um, the book initially began with my thinking about this concept of nostalgia. There's, um, there's a word that to describe a phenomenon that we see now in the former Eastern Bloc. It's a German word, ostalgie. And ostalgie is a portmanteau word. In other words, it's a word that brings together two other words to form a new word. It brings together the German word for nostalgia and the German word for the East. And so, so ostalgie is a nostalgia for the Eastern Bloc and for the, um, the certainty of that time and, and the kind of enclosed, safe vacuum that living in the Eastern Bloc in some ways was. And those of you who have seen the movie Goodbye Lenin will have seen that concept of ostalgie enacted. So at first I thought that the book was going to look at Soviet kitsch. In other words, what does it mean to build a whole aesthetic experience around life in the Eastern Bloc? But very quickly I realized that, um, that the book wasn't really just about exploring and in some ways romanticizing what life in, in the Eastern Bloc was like, but it was really about, um, about my my puberty, <laughs> and um, what what my pr what my press people at the press like to tell me to say when I'm doing interviews is that I use the oppressive language of communism to speak about the oppressiveness of the adolescent body. So that's my sound bite. If anyone asks me what what this book is doing, this is the opening poem in the collection, and it's set in 1986. I remember being 12 years old. And I remember hearing for the first time the name Chernobyl. Chernobyl year. We dreamed of glowing children, their throats alive and cancerous, their eyes like lightning in the dark. We were uneasy in our skins, sixth grade a year for blowing up, for learning that nothing contains that heat which comes from growing. The way our parents seemed at once, both tall as cooling towers, and crushed beneath the pressure of small things, family dinners, the evening news, the dead voice of the dial tone. Even the ground was ticking. The parts that grew, grew poison. Whatever we ate became a stone. Whatever we said was love became plutonium, became a spark of panic in the buried world. And that sort of sets the tone for, for the book, The Chernobyl Disaster, and the way it intersected, for me, with, with being in sixth grade. This next poem is inspired by a perfume that was at one time iconic in the Eastern Bloc. It was a, a horrible perfume called Moscow Nights. And this hopefully will give you a sense of what, what the perfume smelled like. Moscow Nights. Praise rose perfume that smells of piss. Praise the shop girl spraying a wrist with pickled beets and turpentine. Praise ambergris formaldehyde. Praise the bottle sickled gold, its stopper fatter than a comrade's fist. Praise the communist. Praise musk, the deer that gives up greases from its glands. Praise the mermaid, the herring mist, oyster shell, pearl of mucus dreaming in its bed. Praise the customer who, dra who dabs her pulse with chicken fat. Praise dead bouquets behind the grave and praise the grave itself, the dirt a fixative. The wood, an incense to an iron church, the burning scent of snow. Sounds pretty good, right? <laughs> sexy, those sexy Soviets. <laughs> And this next poem is called Obad, and Obad is a dawn song. And traditionally, Obads have been written 
um, to commemorate that moment when the lovers are parting at dawn. So we all have probably seen or, or read that famous scene from Romeo and Juliet when the lovers are trying to postpone the arrival of day and they, kept, they keep convincing the other, no, no, the day hasn't arrived yet. That's a fairly typical example of an obad. And this is my version, obad. Often I lay awake to listen for my parents returning from the embassy, a key toothing the lock, the front door opening to let them in, its rusty hinges a metal warning. Every evening the same. I drank the words cold war from the water glass on my nightstand. I watched the clock hands glow or spoke into my pillow, tapped out minutes with my hand. Sometimes my parents missed the curfew. Trapped at work, they slept on couches made do with a dinner of saltines. They never planned to stay so late, much less to watch the sky from their offices, the night beginning gray then turned to carbon paper. I can't deny the imprint of their absence, the way my room was shadow and the ricochet of light, hard sheets, green hours ticking by. And this is fancy. Those evenings when they dressed for an affair, my parents were most beautiful. My father, stiff, so sensitive to the strip of silk around his throat that he barely moved except to hold the door for my mother. And my mother's neck, a naked thing above her gown, the bow that rustled when she stood, like a satin orchid planted near her skin. Her shoes were thin, sharp knives making a sound I knew as fancy. Click clack, click clack, across the black and white foyer. They pinched her toes, she said, which was her way of telling me loveliness should hurt. Even before she left, her hair loosened from its bun as though something in her wanted to escape. I rarely heard them coming home after the waltz and gin, ungloved, unfastened from the car, his hand resting on the small secret of her back, her zipper finally splitting at its teeth. But I imagined them speaking French or Polish at a party, holding the words so long inside their mouths that language felt like infidelity made me look away. Each morning, my mother's velvet purse wilted on a chair, empty of its midnight contents, ruby lipstick, tiny lake of a pocket mirror. My father's tie lay crumpled on the bed, the romance of objects, both their costumes on hangers again, still clasping the scent of two bodies that bent, unbent, inside of them. No matter how much I grow up, I, I remain fascinated with the idea that our parents exist beyond, outside, and before us. And I think that's a poem that sort of explores the, the idea that parents are completely separate from their children, no matter how um, impossible to believe children may find this. Crossing the Vistula, and the Vistula is, is the most important river in, in Poland, and it runs through, the, runs through Warsaw. Crossing the Vistula. Early mornings, I was the only child on the school bus, black rows of seats so empty that I tried to fill them with my coat, scattered gloves like a pair of misplaced hands. Warsaw sky was low in winter, the sun, white shadow in sleet or snow. The driver turned up the radio so that I could learn the sound of longing in the slow piano which seemed to play all year. Chopin, he said, Pararewski. And I could hear that being Polish was a field of hardened mud and too many footprints, something foreign, always buried there. Always we crossed the bridge above the Vistula Everything I could say about that time was always. Pastries named for the buds of flowers, bouquets with odd numbers of stems, never 12, but 11, 13. Always the first one on, the last one off. And books, little house on the prairie, 
little women, the little princess, all those tiny cities in my bag. This way of being in a place before the streets have woken up, only the movement of bakers and buses, of passing through like water, the glide and tumble of December crows. So most poetry collections, uh, most contemporary poetry collections today have what are known as ars poeticas, and uh, an ars poetica is, about, is a poem about the writing of poetry. Um, and I sort of think of them as the book's mission statement. And that's one of the ars poeticas, it's one of the mission statements of the book, that, that being a poet and being a writer is, is one who passes through, perhaps looking at things through the glass so that there's enough detachment to be able to observe. As we move into the second section of the book, um, this is when that coming of age really starts to happen. And this is where we, we get all the embarrassing poems about puberty. And you'll see that the poems are really try to bring together the language and imagery of communism to speak about what happens to the female body. So this is five-year plan. And of course, if you know anything about the Soviet Union, you know that, that it was famous for its planning, plans that usually didn't go according to plan. Ha ha. So this is five-year plan. Like the Soviets, my body had a plan for every phase of development. First hair in places where it wasn't meant to grow, bramble covering the compound, then curves like water waiting for a dam, then electricity, and worse, a slight atomic humming in my underground, the pulse of something nuclear all night. Adolescence a make of tyranny I couldn't stand against. What to cut back? What to prune or hack into obedience? My coal and oil, my machinery, too much heat for my requirements, all production speeding out of whack. Welcome to being a teenager, right? And that's actually a sonnet. I, I work frequently in what are known as traditional forms. I, I work in rhyme and meter, and I love the received forms that have been passed down through generations of, of poets. This is November 1989, and um, this is the, one of the poems that, that Neil alluded to in his wonderful introduction. November 1989. I locked the bathroom door spent hours with a razor learning not to cut my legs, powdering my arms to change the smell. Outside our house, Warsaw, avenues named for generals, poets from a partitioned century. Everything was falling down, the stone monument with its collapsing nose, the wall that cut Berlin into a figure and its sad reflection. I kept knocking over furniture as though someone had moved the chairs. The days declared themselves through silk drapes. Yellow meant early morning. White was winter dark. When it snowed, my parents called history an unexpected guest who rings the bell. It's here, they said, and sang 100 years, as Poles do to celebrate a birth. They drank so many glasses of champagne. Cocktail parties never stopped their crystal clink or slurp of caviar. How small my dresses hanging in the closet. Pink lace, lettuce leaf hems, pearl buttons down the back. The news was chunked concrete, open checkpoints, fingers making V for victory. When it snowed, the city was clean amnesia the bullet holes from that other war frosted over, faces of buildings gone blank, the whole world trying not to bleed, barely knowing itself in the mirror. And this is another sonnet. It's called Undergarments of the Soviet Era. They were the pair of rockets pointing west a hook and eye defense against the pert weapons of democracy. They propped each breast with starch and molded cups at red alert. They were the corset laced enough to shield plutonium or bulletproof or thick as a concrete wall a country sealed. They only came in fallout and Sputnik. 
Like armored tanks, they only came in shades of camouflage. No pinks or violets, no satin openings, but hard parades of polyester panties, pantalettes that snagged at skin, ballistic garter belts, the girdles leaving autocratic welts. So I had read about an exhibit that apparently took place in Moscow a few years ago, and it was called Undergarments of the Soviet Era, and I thought, wow, what would that look like? <laughs> so I, I wish I'd been able to go see the exhibit, but uh, sometimes um, these things work better in one's imaginations than in, uh, than in real life. And this is another sonnet. Again, I, I love working in traditional forms. It's called Tea. Tonight I'm fruit and clove, I'm bergamot. I drop a tea bag in the cup and boil the kettle until it sings. As if on cue, a part of me remembers how to brew the darker things. Those years, I was a pot of smoky leaves scented with orange oil. Truth is, I don't remember much of school, the crushed up taste of it. I was a drink, forgotten on the table, left to cool. I was a rusted tin marked childhood. I don't remember wanting to be good or bad, but only that I used to sink in water and wait for something to unfurl, the scent of summer in a jasmine pearl. And this is the last poem in the second section. It's called Eastern Block. The stores ran out of butter every day. So you ran out, escaped your parents' house, the crystal vases and the crystal bowls of caviar. You were crystal too, but hollow and ringing to the finger's touch. Around the corner, you heard a polonaise pushed from the lungs of some winded instrument. The sky was soot or else beet soup. So sour, you bought the one limp pastry at the bakery your mouth stuck shut with rose petal jam. You dreamed of warmth, though you were always cold. You dreamed of fleeing west, of white cities where the word for hunger had 10 synonyms and desire was a shopping cart to wheel across the marble floor and everything an open hand promising to be filled. So while the first two sections of the book exist in, um, in a space pre-1989, in other words, during the, the last days of communism in, in the Eastern Bloc, the last section of the, poem, of the book moves into the question of what did the Eastern Bloc start to look like once capitalism arrived? And the reason why I wanted to think about this question was I was really interested in thinking about what it means to be a teenager and the experience of going through adolescence and my memory of adolescence was that it was a time of um, either great deprivation or great excess. And when I was talking to a group of students earlier today, I explained that, you know, if you think about teenagers and their, their ideas and their thoughts about sex, it's always a constant, you know, teenagers are always thinking about sex, their bodies are telling them to think about sex, and yet for most of them it's a great wasteland or a great desert. And that paralleled really nicely with the experience of moving from the terrible deprivation of communism to the excess that we're all so familiar, which is a part of capitalism. And so that mirroring within um, um, Eastern European society mirrors the experience of, of being a teenager, of moving between one, one kind of extreme and another. And the first section of the book let me remember what the first section of the book is called, is Cold War. The second section is the Velvet Revolution, and of course, m many of you will recognize that term. It was, the, it was um, how, we <laughs> how we described the fall of communism um, in the Czech Republic, that it was this revolution that had a kind of quiet um, and elegance to it, as opposed to in other parts of Eastern Europe. And then the final section of the book is called laissez-faire, of course referring to a certain economic system. So this is bag and save. Nobody knows if it is night or day inside the bag and save. We walk the aisles of 20 kinds of paper towels, 
the displays of Reynolds plastic wrap, the perfect smiles that gleam from every tube of crest. We're lost. We lose our family near the razor blades. We lose ourselves watching a steak defrost within the deli case, how it turns a shade of dying in the man-made light. Such thirst. We want to shop and eat. We want to stuff ourselves like Ziploc bags about to burst. We want to be a box of Cocoa Puffs or Captain Crunch. So this is paradise to be on sale among the merchandise. And a lot of the poems in this final section um, think about shopping as an erotic process. This is our free market romance. Is your, is your debit card inside the ATM of me? Is dollars spitting from the slot the paper slap of a receipt? Is you the shopping bag and me the whisper of paisley patterned silk? Is Boku bucks cashmere to the touch? Is your new car smell my luxury of leather seats? Is cruise control is interest free? Is the sticky spot where price tags used to be? Is costume jewelry, is the big box store, the box of plastic things that cost five cents? Is made in China, bed sheets from Peru? Is China plates, is transport to the States? Is the yield our bodies can produce? Is our bargain basement selves? Is the knotted pair of us like shoes? Is the pair of skinny jeans our laissez-faire? Is the green perfume of money making money everywhere? Mmm, gotta love the free market. How many of you have seen the movie Wall Street, the original one from 1987? Just a few, okay. So the, the, this poem is inspired by uh, one of the great characters in, in American film, the character of Gordon Gekko, um, who's the, the sort of the arch hero or arch evil hero of, of Wall Street. So this is puberty as the character of Gordon Gecko. Greed was good, and I was wingtipped and diversified. I had a lot to teach you, pal, about the way ambition ticks inside of us, how it rises like a stock then bottoms out. I clipped the caps of big cigars. I sold while things were hot. Who fucked with me was fucked. Kid, buddy, schmuck. I was the art of war, if war was suspenders and a shark blue shirt. I was the fat portfolio, fat wad of bills, vein of fat in a slab of beef. Greed was good, and I was a Maserati driven off a cliff. A lot of the lines in the poem actually come, they're, they're quotes from the movie. Uh, who is it? Who plays Gordon Gecko? Michael Douglas, he has all these great lines to say in the movie, all of them really awful. And this is Agora. It's inspired by an extraordinary permanent um, installation that's located in Millennium Park if you go to Chicago, um, created, designed by a great Polish artist who's renowned internationally. Her name is Magdalena Abakanowicz, Agora. Because Every crowd at times seems cast in iron, a roughly human shape repeated. These nine-foot figures don't so much surprise as reassure. This is the city. As if by agreement, they lumber about while standing still. Some are turning toward the park, and others face the street. Except above the chest, there is no neck, no face for facing anywhere. We might say they've lost their heads. The Polish artist and her assistants polished each by hand. Some bodies modeled on the surfaces of bark and others mottled fruit. If this were a photograph or a sketch of a mob scene, we would miss how small the installation makes us feel, just as citizens must have felt when standing beneath the marble colonnades in ancient Greece. Columns like sequences of soldiers or long tallies of the dead. Indeed, the artist we learn from her statement has molded the countless in metal or clay. 
the public square of history where a throng can shift from politics to shopping to the sharpened end of a flagpole. All forms are rooted in concrete. Some sink, others try lifting metal feet to walk away. Standing among them, it's clear we're much the same, three-dimensional from the front and from behind the dark relief of hollowed trees. As I was reading that poem, I suddenly thought, there's your ancient Greece. <laughs> Somebody was asking me about this, about this poem earlier, so I'll, I think I'll read it. Uh, my, my great um, love, like so many girls my age when I was 12 years old, was a, a young actor who's now, I think, more an emblem of, of wasted promise, River Phoenix. Um, and I remember when he died, it was like John Lennon had died to, to many girls my age. So this is River Phoenix. Somewhere you're still alive outside the Viper Room. And maybe getting old is what you are. Round around the middle, cracking beers with Kurt Cobain. Both of you still slouched in perpetuity movie star and rock star, still beautiful in the vein of neglected instruments leaned up against a wall. And perhaps your analog in a discontinuous world, still bearing your collarbone to a midnight audience that has trouble sleeping. And while the rest of us leave our 20s the way we leave cities for suburbia, because what else is there? You're still following the rumor of a body past train tracks to the river of your name. And of course, that body is the great movie, Stand By Me. I hope, I hope many of you have seen that. It's a, it's a great film. I'll read the poem that inspires the cover um, of the collection. It's inspired by a, um, a, a shade of lipstick from MAC Cosmetics called Russian Red. So this is Russian Red. I tried to get them to put the exact stick of lipstick on the cover, but apparently there were copyright issues. Russian Red. When you are writing a book about Russians and the red of winter hands, not to mention beet soup and certain parts of the body, everything takes on the shade of your poems. Your car is red, the steak you ate for lunch, the wallet you bought at Bloomingdale's is just reiteration of the theme. No surprise, perhaps, that, to, that the tube of lipstick, resembling more projectile or ballpoint pen, sits so nicely in your hand. The sales associate shows how to pencil your lips with nude, a hyper-nakedness like a clean piece of paper, before swiping the real color across your lips. How red they look and the bluish undertone of the makeup makes your teeth whiter. You wanted to seem French, but your mouth declares its independence. This thing you are writing, it says, is garish and beautiful and bullet-shaped. I'll just read a few more poems from the collection. This poem is, um, is a parody of a great poem by W.H. Auden called Musée, Musée de Beaux-Arts. Um, and it's an, it's an incredible and very important poem in um, 20th century literature in which the poet looks at a, an, an important painting by Bruegel, Landscape with the Fall of Icarus, and meditates on this, this beautiful Flemish painting. So this is Warsaw Ikea, with apologies to W.H. Auden. About shopping, they are never wrong, the new poles. How well they understand the Fintorp baskets and Billy bookshelves. How these replace buying butter from the state or black marketeering or just standing in a queue. How when the young are passionately waiting at the checkout to pay for clapsta chairs, there always must be the old guard berating Warsaw for its steel suspension bridge and planned communities. They can recall the appealing gray of cinder block, pockmarked heroic plaques unscrewed from walls, kiosks that still stock Russian cigarettes and coffee. In Ikea, for instance, how everyone turns toward the display of Rona's candlesticks, 
The document letter tray is also on sale, and why not spring for a set of slit bar knives? The lights shine as they have to on white counters and green kitchens, and the stabile splatter screen will fit most frying pans. And each amazing buy, Almstead and Skin, Besta and Rod, can be found in aisles 1 through 29. Again, Auden's poem is extraordinary and sensitive and beautiful and is about the tragedy of ignoring uh, atrocity when it's happening right in front of you. And my poem is about Ikea. <laughs> so I'll just read these, these two more poems. Uh, I became really fascinated with ways in which, uh, which my experiences were translated to um, to the 21st century. So I spent a lot of time looking at solidarity and martial law um, memorabilia on, on eBay and trying to find these, these small vestiges of my childhood in these commercial spaces. And I found this great video on YouTube that I just found to be hysterical. It's called YouTube Tornado Throws a Bus. This isn't Kansas, but southern Poland and the sky is green as dollar bills. A bus idling beside what could be any country road in any country, folded over trees, sick grass of summer, small houses at the vanishing, while the camera records air that bends at speeds increasingly malevolent, rounding toward the people in the bus who shout, quiet, and there in front of us, then scream Jesus in the vocative, Jesu, Jesu, Jesu. Too late, of course, too late, because in a place historically too flat to halt armies as they churn up dirt, thresh fields with boots or the treads of armored tanks, what can stop this American import, this wind which makes amnesia of the landscape, wiping everything away? the horizon turning on its side, the bus tipped like a shot glass on a table, bodies tumbling at seats and windows before the world goes pixelated black. Clearly a tornado knocking over a bus is not particularly hysterical. Uh, but what I found interesting was the idea that any of us here, even if we are have lived in places where tornado country is familiar, would be stopped and sort of awestricken if we saw a tornado in front of us. But you really have no familiarity with tornadoes in a place like the middle of the country in Poland. So the idea of this tornado coming through um, this Polish landscape just fascinated me and clearly presented itself as metaphor. So I'm going to end with the last poem in the book. And the poem uh, takes its cues from a very famous communist era Polish joke. So this is the joke. Question, a Polish soldier has to choose between killing a Russian or a German soldier. Which does he shoot first? And the punchline to the joke is, he kills the German first, business before pleasure. Which gives you a little sense of, which gives you a little sense of the, the the way poles feel about their neighbors. Yeah. So this is the poem takes its title from that joke before pleasure. We trafficked in the oldest jokes like a conversation everybody knew. Where do you find the finest view in Warsaw? Why do police patrol in groups of three? Something about how many bureaucrats it takes to screw a light bulb in. Something about democracy. We were experts in the conditional. If June, then cherries in a paper bag. So much was out of reach. Not just the blonde who shimmied on the naked stage we called America. Not just the shopping mall of her skin. But even the idea of her was blue jeans stacked on a shelf too high to touch. Knock, knock, we said tapping the window of the store that closed 10 years ago, that trick of glass, transparent and impassable. Thank you. Oh, you mean just other poems in the book? 
Yeah, you just read the room, um, and depending on what you're getting, um, who's looking bored, who's looking interested, you know, you, you, it's improvis improvisational. Um, yeah. I love. Oh, no. no, Barsch. Yeah, I love I love beet soup. Um, I love Polish food, actually. Um, My grandfather was Polish. He felt the same way about the Germans and the Russians. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's a, it hasn't changed much, I think. The, even if you read like the local Warsaw newspapers today, the, the the same conversations and the same concerns about their neighbors is still going on. Yeah. <laughs> I just did a reading in, in Baltimore last week, and there was a woman in the audience who was, when, I came, when she came up to me afterwards, I thought she was Polish before, but I, she looked so Polish, but she came up to me afterwards and, and said, yes, this is exactly what I remember. So one of the things I was worried about with the book is that as the child of American diplomats, I experienced some privilege that, um, that obviously your local Warsaw citizen wouldn't. And so I was worried about finding a balance between acknowledging um, the ways in which we were more fortunate as Americans with American currency living in the Eastern Bloc and the ways in which we also shared in that experience. And there are some poems in the book that are written um, in first person plural, we, um, to, to imply this more collective Polish experience. I didn't really read any of those tonight. They haven't, but that would be that would be awesome. I mean, I think that would be cool. Y you know, it's hard, of course, if you work in form, mm -hmm. because then the translator has to figure out, first of all, how and if to to try to duplicate those formal conceits. Uh, I mean, there's sonnets in every language at this point, but then how do you how do you replicate some of the music that's happening, or do you just choose to create a music of your own? Yeah. But I think that would be amazing. Thank you very much.